It's F1 Nation with TC and me. This week, Christian Horner tells us what Alex Albon has to do to stay with Red Bull. We take an in-depth look at the driver market and Roman Grosjean picks his greatest hits as he prepares to leave F1. But first, the history boy. Portugal is getting its Grand Prix back. Lights out and we are racing. Valtteri Bottas fights back into the braking zone and he's forced Max Verstappen off the road. And there's contact between Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez. The two Mercedes very close on track and Valtteri Bottas takes the lead. Kimi Raikkonen is in another league right now. Carlos Sainz takes the lead for McLaren. That is mesmeric stuff from him. Here's Bottas retaking the lead of the Grand Prix. Stroll is hit at that corner again. What the f*** is Lewis Hamilton takes the lead from his teammate and closest rival in the championship. Perez hunts down Esteban Ocon. Still they go side by side, take a bow, both of them. Lewis Hamilton climbs the hill to win the Portuguese Grand Prix and claim the all-time win record. It's 92 and counting. He is now the driver with the most victories in Formula One history. AJ, it was a privilege to witness history being made in Portugal and fittingly, it was a truly dominant performance by Lewis Hamilton, his largest winning margin of 2020. And it really meant something too, because he's so often impenetrable after a race, yet I saw it. He was bouncing around like Tigger after coming off the podium before coming into the press conference, chasing his physio, Angela, around the room with a bottle of champagne. It was great (laughs) to see. And I mean, AJ, what a career, what a driver, what a day. Yeah, it really was. Let's get straight into it then. An incredible landmark for Formula One. Tom Clarkson, do you ever think we'll see Hamilton's eventual total beaten? Well, you made a really good point on this podcast a couple of weeks ago, AJ, when you said, I don't think we will see it being beaten because if the new rules in 2022 do what they're supposed to do, which is make the whole field more competitive, then you're not going to end up with one driver in a competitive car in the way that Hamilton has been. So hard to see, hard to see. And he ain't stopping yet. Let's let's not forget that. I think he's going to go well over 100, well over 100. If he gets 120, even if you had a 25 race season, you've got to be taking 10 wins a year. And most drivers get about a decade in the sun. It's one of the things to underline about Lewis Hamilton. He's done this year in, year out. Uh, 2013, he only had the one win. But he's won in every season. And that is what is so rare. Will we get periods of domination in the same way? be unlikely the rules wouldn't be working i think liberty would respond very very quickly to any similar period of domination like this remember if this was a pandemic free year this would be the end of the regulations 2021 would hopefully see a more competitive order and yet he's got a chance to get another 15 hasn't he next year let's be honest mercedes have already said that they've stop the development on the current car a while back, focusing on next year's car. Okay, there's a a few little aero tweaks to try and uh, slow the cars down. We're going to continue seeing history being made. And at least with every Hamilton victory now, we can say, okay, he's raised the bar a little bit further, a little bit further each time. And how high can he go? I think if he gets to 115, 120, I don't think anyone's going to beat that. I think that's just going to stand... For I mean, there's a physical limit to the amount of Grand Prix that you can host a season without exhausting anyone. Now, you can lop off Fridays and that would change things. But there is a limit still to how much you can fly people around the world and expect them to perform to the high level at every single department. Uh, Will we ever see? It's only the third time in 47 years that we'd seen that win record change hands uh, twice in Portugal, weirdly. But will we ever see that happen again? there's a possibility that that's the last time you'll see someone take the win record for themselves. Well done to Lewis Hamilton. Well, let's get straight into the mailbag then because Phil Wright wants to know the F1 Nation thoughts on the driver market as we are fully in the middle of silly season. Well, Phil, I hope you've got a spare hour because it's time to dive in to this year's driver market and there is a lot going on, TC. 
Well, Phil, it's all getting pretty tasty at Red Bull right now. I thought it was interesting slash extraordinary that Christian Horner on the eve of this Portuguese Grand Prix should put him into an impossible situation that it's hard to see him surviving. He said he's got Portugal and Imola to grab hold of that 2021 Red Bull and huge pressure. And unfortunately for Alex, it was his second worst finish of the season in the Grand Prix on Sunday in Portimao. And earlier in the week, I caught up with Christian and this is what he said. We want Alex to claim that seat and, and um, you know, basically justify that there is no need to look at any other alternative um, than Alex. I think everybody in the team wants him to, to see him do that. And it felt like Imagello was starting to turn the corner and so on. He's had a couple of difficult weekends. So he needs to bounce back here, I think, and particularly Imola with a from start to finish. So that's our focus. That's our objective. I think, as I say, he's a popular member of the team. But we need two cars, you know, closer together in order to fight the Mercedes. And that's, that's what we've got to do. That's what we've got to, you know, that's our target. Is there any other driver in the Red Bull pool that you would look at if Alex doesn't step up in the way that you hope? No. No, um, I think you know AlphaTauri are pretty settled in you know with their drivers. So you know, uh, as I say, our preference is is very much Alex. But if we had to uh, look at a different solution, then obviously we would have to uh, look outside of the Red Bull pool of drivers, simply because um, you know there's not one available that we would look to look to put in so and there's you know some quality drivers obviously on the market that could be unemployed for next year what a departure it would be tc for red bull to abandon that philosophy that they've been chasing for over a decade now of growing their own talent nurturing their own talent within the driver program and there you are on the record christian horner saying we're not going to put our race winner Pierre Gasly back in that second Red Bull. We're going to look outside the program if Alex doesn't work out. Also, you know Alex Albon. I know Alex Albon. Is there a question here of how you motivate a character like him? Because some drivers need a kick up the backside. Some drivers need an arm around the shoulder. I don't think that anyone would think that the way to motivate Alex Albon is a kick. What's been very interesting about Alex is... His performances since the Tuscan Grand Prix, I I really thought that that race was going to be the one that gave him the leg up he needed to just get more consistent. We're going to see more podiums from him. And yet we've, he's actually only scored one point since that podium at Mugello. It's like, does he put too much pressure on himself? I don't know, but it's a really difficult situation. And I just feel so desperately sorry for him. I, I wind the clock back to Spa last year, his first race for the team. Drove so brilliantly in the race and we were all so hopeful for him that, yes, this is the guy they need to put alongside Max Verstappen. Yet he's just fallen by the wayside in the way that so many of those young drivers do. And I think maybe for that reason, that is why they're going to look outside their pool because it's just too much pressure. Max Verstappen is just too good to put any other young guy trying to make a name for himself alongside him. You need a tried and tested performer of which Sergio Perez, Nico Hülkenberg are those things. They would go into that team knowing their place. Their place isn't to challenge Max Verstappen and to beat him. Their place is to be a very solid supporting act of which both of those two drivers are. So AJ, of Hülkenberg and Perez, who would you sign and why? Uh, Between the two, I'd probably go for Sergio Perez. For so long, he has created quite a lot, eight podiums to be exact, out of very little sometimes. And he's had to go on alternate strategies to do that. This is a guy who got McLaren, which is the definition of a good seed in Formula One, at the wrong time. I think he would deserve uh, that chance again. And I think he would make great use of it. Uh, So nothing against Hülkenberg, who has always been searingly quick and would certainly help them on a Saturday. But I think if you are going to look outside the pool of drivers, if you've got a car where you need a really aggressive style, 
then Red Bull might be kicking themselves that they didn't come to this realization sooner because there is one standout candidate for a driver who would harangue the car and be able to adapt to any style if they were going out of the market, if they'd identified it this sooner, Fernando Alonso would have been an absolutely perfect teammate for Max Verstappen. Forget the baggage, because for two and a half years, that second Red Bull has been a problem. Oh, AJ. Wow. Fernando Alonso. That's interesting. They've admitted that that car is super difficult to drive, and that has clearly been what's undone Pierre Gasly at his time with the team there. And now Alex Albon is seemingly driving devoid of confidence because there is no way that Alex Albon is 80 seconds a Grand Prix slower than Max Verstappen in the same way that when Pierre Gasly was getting lapped at the Hungara ring, there was no way that that was reflective of his ability. And it's been great that Gasly has been able to prove that this year. Another strong performance on Sunday. Sunday. Alonso could adapt to any driving style required. He was perfect to put in that car. It is a shame that we will not see that. But would Alonso have accepted second fiddle to Max Verstappen? That's what management's all about. Okay, it would have been more of a headache. But what did Christian say to you in that interview? We need that second car to be closer. The easiest way to make sure that that second car was closer would have been Fernando Alonso. Multi-21, Max. Multi-21, <laughs> Max. I can hear it now. I mean, look, it uh, wouldn't have made their life easier, but we'd have loved it. I would love to see a Fernando Alonso alongside Lewis Hamilton as well. Sort of take two, 2007 repeat. Let's see what happens <laughs> there. But of course it doesn't happen. And on the Perez front, brilliant driver, completely agree with you. But what makes him doubly appealing is that he comes with a bit of Mexican cash. And of course, Red Bull Racing are going to be losing their Aston Martin sponsorship next year. They've got a hole to fill. So Perez brings money to to plug that hole. And he's a great driver, very consistent. If the car is capable of podiums next year, he will deliver those podiums. I'm absolutely sure of it. Of the two, Love Hulk would love to see him get that podium that he so richly deserves. But I think you'd have to go Perez for all of those reasons. That would be my thinking anyway. Perez or Hulkenberg ends up alongside Max Verstappen. What do you do with a guy like Alex Albon? Because I think, AJ, unless I'm wrong, we both believe he deserves a place in Formula One. Do you just put him back to Alpha Tauri and maybe put him in position where Pierre Gasly is because of course another driver rumor this weekend in Portugal is that Gasly wants to go to Renault so (laughs) Gasly were to go to Renault then that frees up a nice place for Alex to go alongside that really promising young talent Yuki Tsunoda of course (laughs) Yuki Tsunoda Claxon it's happened again (laughs) he's testing at Imola next week after the race isn't he yeah that is very important for him I think it'd be a crying shame if Alexander Albon's Formula One career ends at the end of this season. At the very least, you'd like to see him get a chance to respond to a year like this. I think if you put him in the Alpha Tauri, I think he'd have a similar redemptive arc that Pierre Gasly's had this year. Wouldn't it be wonderful, actually, to see them alongside each other in the Alpha Tauri next year? It's a good little car, seemingly easier to drive, on the limit anyway, than the Red Bull. And so to put Alex in there. But then what do you do with... Yuki, what do we do with you? You keep Sonoda. him in Formula 2 and you watch him contend for the title along with Robert Schwartzman and along with Christian Lingard. Actually, on a serious note, you think Yuki actually needs another year, is that right? I think you'll get a better quality of Yuki Sonoda if you give him a second season in Formula 2. I think he's a huge talent, but we want to see drivers performing to their absolute best to their potential. It has been uncomfortable to watch what happened to Pierre Gasly. It's been wonderful to watch the response. It is uncomfortable to watch what's happening to Alexander Albon. You just want to see the best from the drivers in Formula One. There might be a few of you out there listening to that and going, occasionally you've got to wake up and you've got to say, you're quick, you're not quick enough. You want to see what the drivers actually got. And if you rush a driver into Formula One, occasionally you don't get that reality. So let's just go over it one more time. We think it's going to be Max Verstappen and probably Sergio Perez at Red Bull Racing. Pierre Gasly and Alexander Albon at Alpha Tauri with Yuki Tsunoda putting together a championship challenge in Formula 2. Is that what we think? I think that would be best for everyone's career. 
So let's talk next about Williams because another slightly left field rumour that was doing the rounds in Portugal was George Russell, who was announced, confirmed as a Williams driver for 2021 by Claire Williams earlier in the year. Obviously, new chapter, new owners, new rumours. Is George in or out, Alex? I think he's in because we've just given the Red Bull seat to Sergio Perez. I want the answer to how good is George Russell in Formula One. And if he's not on the grid next year, we might not get an accurate answer to that question. Because I think it's taken Esteban Ocon a long time to get back up to form. I think we saw that form on Sunday. George needs to stay put is the short answer to that question. The rumours then, or certainly George Russell believes, the rumours about him being ousted from the team and replaced by Sergio Perez were put out there by (laughs) Julian Jacobi, the wily old driver manager who looks after Checo Perez. George believes he's put those rumours out there to apply pressure on Red Bull to get them to make a decision. Now, that sounds plausible until you hear what acting team principal Simon Roberts said on the subject. Williams confirmed both of its drivers for 2021. Has the picture changed in recent weeks? Uh, No, nothing's changed. I mean, there's lots of speculation. There's lots of good drivers around uh, that are looking for seats. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, Dalton bought the team and nothing changed. So, um, yeah, I can't say any more than that. When you say nothing has changed, so are you confirming that... George Russell and Nicholas Latifi will be with the team in 2021. I'm not. I'm not going to say anything about either of our drivers. They're both doing a great job, but you know, there's so much speculation around. I don't want to inadvertently fuel it. Someone will take some nuance of whatever we say. So, so we're happy. Um, let's let's watch the rest of the market. Okay, we'll leave it there. Uh, Simon, thank you. Let's go to the video conference now, and we'll start, please, with Dieter Rankin from Racing Lines, please. Uh, thank you, Tom. Well, well on that, um, Simon, could you confirm, please, that you will honour the contract to both drivers and that they will be with the team next year, please? Uh, I'm just not going to talk about it. Um, it it's, uh, you know, Dalton bought the team. Nothing changed with regards to the drivers. And uh, there's just so much speculation and rumour. It's crazy. It's silly season after all. So, uh, yeah, we're not saying any more than that. Okay, thank you. We'll go next to Scott Mitchell from The Race, please. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, to, to Simon as well, please. I, I appreciate what you what you said in the, the answers there that you don't want to, to fuel the speculation, but um, would it not make sense or be possible to extinguish that speculation by, by ruling out the chance of signing Sergio Perez to replace either driver? Uh, yeah, possibly, but, but we just don't want to say anything one way or the other. We're, you know, we're here focusing on a race weekend, and um, you know, it wasn't. You know, we haven't got any news. So uh, Gunter's here; he's he has got some news. So you know, we we got plenty on this morning. We've run in lots of parts in FP1, and uh, we've got to get through all that and get both our drives in the best possible place for Saturday and Sunday. Situation diffused. Everybody's happy. No story to write. Well, that's the thing: is that I didn't believe for a second about these Perez rumours. Um, but because Simon said what he said, you then start to think, well, maybe it's plausible. Maybe it is plausible. Maybe the discussions are happening. But I'm with you. I think if Perez ends up at Red Bull Racing, then all is good in the world of George Russell and he will be at Williams. So on to Alfa Romeo we go. And for so long, we thought this was going to be a change, potentially of both drivers. And now we're hearing that it's going to be the same two back once again for 2021. And that's bad news for Hulkenberg because his best chance of being on the grid was rekindling a working relationship with Fred Vasseur. Yep, Fred, very keen on Hulkenberg. But when Raikkonen's doing opening laps like the one he did on Sunday, 16th to 6th, the guy needs another shot. There's no doubt about that. Watching the onboard back, if you haven't, done so please dig it out because it is just joyous you really saw his experience coming through if if you go and have a look at the onboard because you know he takes the opportunities when they're there 
And yet he also is very conservative when he needs to be as well. And then you look at the collisions that have taken place over the Portuguese Grand Prix weekend. And so do we think this is why Alfa Romeo want to keep Kimi Raikkonen in the car for 2021? If that's the case, why has this not been announced yet? Why has this not been signed? Because there's been speculation that Kimi's done the deal for about a month now and still no announcement. Because I think he's just working out how much he wants to come round again. And I'm sure that race in Portugal will have helped him make that decision uh, in the affirmative. And do you know what? I've really noticed that Kimi is just a really happy chappy at the minute. He talks more than most other drivers now in a press conference. But, you know, I like the cut of his jib. He, he's just walking around. He's funny. He seems very happy. He goes home to his wife and children and that's where he recharges. And he just is in a very, very good place at the minute. And I think as a result, we're going to see him next year, which is great for Formula One. I was slightly hoping that we'd have Mick Schumacher alongside him as well. Because uh, I think Schumacher and Raikkonen in the same team, how fantastic would that be? But it appears, now AJ, you might have the inside line on this, that Schumacher's going to be somewhere else. Yeah, we expect Mick Schumacher now to be announced as a Haas driver alongside Nikita Mazepin in what will be a contract obligation for all commentators to refer to as an exciting young lineup. <laughs> well, Mick Schumacher is an exciting young driver. Great name, obviously, wonderful family, but leading Formula 2 and deserving of his place. And Nikita Mazepin will provide us with a lot of entertainment, I'm sure. Do you think there's going to be a lot of accident damage? Could be, but in the loveliest way possible, that's been a problem for Haas in the last couple of years anyway. Well, with the news breaking at the start of the Portuguese Grand Prix that Roman Grosjean is almost certainly looking at an F1 exit, Tom decided to ask him for his greatest hits. Roman, it's great to have you on the show. Now, you and Haas are parting company at the end of the year, and I don't want to get into the whys and wherefores, the rights and wrongs of that decision. What we want to do here on The Nation is celebrate some of your best races. I've chosen three and I want you to give us three of your best as well. And you've got a fair few races to choose from, 175 in all. So what's your number one? Wow, okay. I'll say Austin 2013. I did manage to split the Red Bulls. Uh, Sebastian, that was dominating the whole field at the time, only finished about seven seconds in front of me at the end of the race. I did manage to get the fastest lap close to the end. He, he got it back, but... You know, I mean, time management and so on, we, we, there were no chance before the race and strategy and so on to beat one of the Red Bull, and, and we actually did. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was a pretty cool second place. Right, my turn. I'm going to go a little bit left field because I'm going to choose a race that you didn't even finish. But if you had, I think you might have won it. Yes. Would you agree? There's been a few occasions like this, but it never happened. The Valencia Grand Prix of 2012. You were running within one second of Fernando Alonso, who went on to win the race. When you were forced to retire with an alternator problem, you were so fast up to that problem. And that's why I think you would have won that race. That's my first choice. Now, back to you. Where are you going to go next? Um, next, I will say Monza 2018. I got disqualified, right. But for no real, I mean, no performance reason, uh, I, I did manage to hold off. I think it was the two racing racing point, Force India, whatever it was their name at the time. And um, they were straight line where they, about, they were about 28 kph faster with the DRS Open than I was. And I really had to manage a lot where, you know, how to use my energy and when to deploy it or not, because it was quite hard to judge how much they would catch by the end of the straight line. That was a really tactical race, wasn't it? Right, my turn again. I'm going to go this time with Canada 2012, which was another second place for you. And you finished just two and a half seconds behind Lewis Hamilton and you passed Fernando Alonso late in the race. It was another great performance. I did. And you know what? If I hadn't missed my start on that race... I got stuck behind, I think it was Paul Di Resta, 
and I lost a fair bit of time early in the race. If that hadn't been the case, Lewis would have definitely come out of the pit after his second pit stop behind me a fair bit. And I don't know if he would have had the speed to overtake me. But also in that race, I run P6 for a long time. And I kind of resigned myself to say, well, I'm going to finish P6 today because I couldn't really pass Mark Webber. Um, and I think it may have been Michael in front of me. And they all pitted. And we didn't. And uh, Alonso, who didn't pit it, completely ran out of tyres. And I got him three laps to the end or so. But uh, it just unfolded for me quite nicely. Yeah, it was a great race. Another cracker from Roman Grosjean. But if you've got another one to throw into the mix, what's your third choice? Okay, I'm going to go for Barcelona 2014, where we drove probably one of the ugliest cars of the history, the double nose at Lotus. Um, I qualified fifth. We've got no idea how, he, how that happened. I ran the whole race on five cylinder because we have had a, it was the V6 at the time, but we had one cylinder not firing up. And I still managed to finish, what was it, P7 or P8, something like that, with that car that was probably one of the slowest. And um, I mean, we, we couldn't repeat that performance, uh, but it was, it worked. Yep. That was sort of Schumacher-esque in the way you drove around that problem. Do you remember 1994 when Michael had to drive a lot of the Spanish Grand Prix stuck in one gear? Well, I've got one more and I feel it's only fair to go for your last podium, which was, of course, Spa 2015. I think Lotus had the bailiffs in the paddock that weekend. So you guys were right up against it. And yet you finished third. And I remember a very emotional Romain Grosjean after that race. Yes. I knew you would go, You were going to pick up that one. It, it's very hard, you know, to pick up three years. And I, I actually tried to go through the years, um, not only picking some some old ones and so on. Obviously, in Formula One or in sports in general, the result is important. You know, you won't find a team saying that was the best best, best football game if they have lost. Um, and obviously, but yeah, that that was a crazy weekend. We were, I mean, in qualifying, I qualified fourth. And no one could expect that. We were actually doing bets based on wine with a friend of mine. So the position would, were, were defined by a bottle of wine. The win was a Petrus. I think you got off lightly there, Roman, because a win would have cost you a fair few bob. <laughs> yes. And, and so my friend went to see Ayo Komatsu, which was the chief, chief engineer, which is now the chief engineer has, and say, Ayo, what's possible to do in qualifying? So he could set up the bets to, you know, a decent level he says there's no chance we're going to be in the top five so top p4 was actually a very nice bottle of wine and here i crossed the line p4 at a five grid place penalty for changing the gearbox on friday but we didn't have a friday and a saturday gearbox so i started p9 the race and yes overtook the williams uh the red bulls um the force india and at the end I mean, did that time I got lucky with Sebastian picking up a, a puncture late in the race and got on the podium. All in all, a very emotional day for you. Now, of all the cars you've driven, which was the best? Lotus 2013. Was it better than the 2012 car? Yeah. Yeah, I really got it to a place that I was <laughs> very happy with. We had a blown exhaust that was working quite well. And um, I love the V8 engine as well. Good noise. And I just could do whatever I wanted with that car. A really good front end. Sometimes a bit of a weak rear end, but uh, I just, I just with the blown exhaust, you could go on throttle and just manage that. Do you know what? I can't believe you didn't win a race. There have been so many near misses throughout your career. Yes, the star never got aligned. But hey, this is this is sports, you know. Yeah. I know for me the most important is to finish a race and knowing that I've I've given my absolute best, you know. And, and yes, the last two years haven't been great in terms of results. But when I finish the race, and I know even if it's a P12, and I know I've, I've done everything I could, I've been driving as fast as I could, well, there isn't much more I can ask for myself. Well, Roman, it's been wonderful watching you over the last decade or so. And thanks for your memories here on F1 Nation.
Great to hear from Roman Grosjean. There is no doubting that he has had an extraordinary Formula One, uh, was placed alongside Fernando Alonso, basically hit over the head with Fernando Alonso, had to fight his way back to get his F1 chance after winning the GP2 title. There have been low moments, but I'm glad that we emphasised the high points there because that's a driver with 10 podiums in Formula One. And just to chuck another suggestion in the mix, I really enjoyed his drive in Suzuka 2013 with that car that he labelled as his favourite. Just nine seconds he finished away from Sebastian Vettel. He was in third. He was just behind Mark Webber on the road as well. That is peak Sebastian Vettel. That is a dominant Red Bull championship winning car. And behind him, not behind him by a little bit, behind him by a lot. Fernando Alonso, 30 seconds down the road. Grosjean on form on his day, a worthy Formula One podium finisher. And as you said to him, unlucky not to win. But Alex, you make a really good point. Grosjean on his day is as quick as any driver on the grid. And that's why he's so frustrating because the peaks are very high. There was just a lack of consistency all the way through. And that ultimately has been his undoing. And I know you said he was whacked over the head by Fernando Alonso when he came in in 2009. And yes, you're right. But I remember vividly his first race, Valencia. And who was this young guy with the mad hair? Do you remember the mad (laughs) hair that he had? Young guy comes in and he was only three tenths of a second off Alonso in qualifying. And I remember thinking... Right, okay, this guy's clearly very quick. But then, of course, the topsy-turvy career continued. And I think what he's lacked is a little bit of discipline. And I think that comes over in the way he communicates over the radio. I think in the way he drives. Weber calling him a first lap nutcase. (laughs) Japan 2012. And, of course, causing the accident at Spa in 2012. Just quickly got labelled as that man. And I think... Had he been in a, let's imagine for a second that he was in a Mercedes environment. And I think with a Bono type character race engineering him and giving him the structure he needs to improve and get consistent. I think we might have seen uh, a different outcome for, for Roman Grosjean. But there we go. It's been good having him in the sport, no doubt. And so TC, Formula One is about to return to Imola which is going to be, well, it's going to evoke so much history. Ah, wonderful racetrack. And all the guys and girls, because the teams as well, have been bowled a bit of a googly this weekend because it's a bespoke two-day weekend. Yes, we had two-day weekend in in Nürburgring as it panned out, but it wasn't meant to be. That was weather-related. This is a two-day weekend. So, for example, I'm not turning up at the track until Friday morning, because that's the media day. What is normally Thursday is Friday. They're going to get one practice session. They're going to get one practice session on Saturday morning and then bam, straight into qualifying. None of them, except Kimi Raikkonen, have raced there in Formula One before. So it's going to be a huge learning curve and I cannot wait to see it. I'm really looking forward to seeing these modern cars on the track. It's an evocative venue. It's got the Ferrari history. Uh, The last time that we raced there, there was a super close race between two greats of Formula One. It is going to be special for F1 to go back there. And the two-day weekend, that's just going... It feels very F1 2020 that there's another unusual element in the mix. And we all love an iconic corner name, don't we, in... Aqua Minerali. Oh. oh, AJ, I can't wait to hear you say that on your comms. That's going to be great fun. That's going to oh. be really great fun. Really looking forward to that. Not long to wait. And we've nearly come to the end of this week's F1 Nation. Remember to leave a review and subscribe. And if you have done so, then why not leave us a comment, question, or any of the above to the hashtag F1 Nation. Although... We said this last week, and oh my word, did this cause chaos. We asked you, what was your favorite Formula One car? And 6,000 of you responded. TC, I was thinking we could close out this week's episode by reading every single suggestion. How long have you got? I've got ages. Okay, so Tiago said the McLaren MP44. Andre said the MP46. Joseph said the Jordan EJ10. Carmen wanted to know where the six-wheel Tyrrell was and the McLaren MP44 and the MP427.